This episode is sponsored by Free Market Kids. Join the league of families who are transforming family time into unforgettable Bitcoin learning experiences. With our Hoddle Up Bitcoin mining board game, you're not just playing. You're building bridges, creating memories, and unlocking the brilliance of the future one block at a time. financial independence retire early. It's a group of people who decided to live on half of their income or less than half of their income and pool that money into stocks or equities or whatever you feel most compelled that it's the best asset. The FIRE movement people were saying once you reach the million dollar point, then you can live off of 4% and then you'll be able to earn 40000 a year and you'll be straight. But in 2019, with 2020, with the pandemic, so much money was printed. I was like, there's no way we're going to be able to just withdraw 4% if inflation is 10, 15, 20% for food. Some food items would double. We're dealing with hundreds of percent of inflation. And I was like, I'm not sure about this. I might have to go back to the drawing board. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Orange Hatter. Hello listeners, if you're a woman in the Bitcoin space looking for a transformative getaway, then today's feature is just for you. We've tailored an exclusive retreat designed for rejuvenation, connection, and empowerment specifically for women like you. Picture this, mornings that begin with yoga by the ocean, days filled with the awe-inspiring beauty of nature, and conversations with fellow Bitcoin enthusiasts that turn into lasting friendships. This retreat is not just a break from your routine, It's a leap forward for your spirit and career. But it's more than relaxation and networking. We're actively supporting local Bitcoin circular economies. Your participation means contributing to real world change, connecting you with the impact of Bitcoin beyond the screen. This is an opportunity to step away from the daily grind, to recharge and to return inspired. Whether you're deep into your Bitcoin journey or just starting, this retreat will offer you valuable insights, support, and a renewed sense of purpose. Ready to be part of this unique experience? Visit www.orangehatter.com forward slash Yucatan now to learn more and reserve your spot. Spaces are limited as we aim to create an intimate and impactful experience for each attendee. Don't miss this chance to recharge, connect, and contribute. Join us. Let's make this retreat a milestone in your Bitcoin journey. Thank you for tuning in, and here's to empowering your path in the world of Bitcoin. We can't wait to welcome you. Raven, thank you so much for joining us on Orange Hatter. I can't wait to dive into your Bitcoin story. Welcome. Thank you for having me, Tally. Let's start by telling us a little bit about your personal background so we can uh, understand where you're coming from. Hello, world. My name is Praven. I grew up in Georgia, and I'm currently in the beautiful Central Florida. And probably from the age of 15, I've been working I'm mostly to retail, restaurants, and I spent at the height of my career, I was at Aflac in accounting. I start learning about Bitcoin around the time that I went to school for massage therapy, spa therapies, seaweed wraps, all that good stuff. And while I was in class, on my way coming home from school, I saw an ad about Bitcoin. I think it was on CNBC, and they were talking about Bitcoin hitting a dollar. This was in 2011. And at the time I was, what is Bitcoin? And what does it matter to hit a dollar? I have a dollar right here. I don't need a, a digital dollar. I know, right? Yeah, that's pretty much where it started in 2011, finding out about Bitcoin on the news. Wow. Okay. So I don't even remember when Bitcoin was a dollar because I wasn't paying attention back then. So what happened after that? Really nothing, because at the time, it wasn't important to me. I didn't understand the value behind it. I didn't understand why I would even need something like Bitcoin, other than the fact that people were talking about it on the news, but I brushed it off. And that was pretty much it for a while until fast forward, I think in 2017, around the time my husband and I had either just got married or we were about to get married, have a wedding. And his best man asked us if we were into crypto. And I was like, no, I don't really believe in that stuff. You can't print money out of thin air. And he was like, I got some and I got da da da. At this time, it's considered altcoin or a ship coin. He was like, yeah, I got some and I'm making a lot of money. And I was like, all right, I hope it works out for you. But inside, I was like, crypto is such a scam. That was the time. And but I, when I, I kept thinking about that moment, because that was a pivotal moment for me, I was 
I just kept thinking about what I said, like, you know, you can't print money out of thin air. What is money? Where does it even come from? I started to look into what is money at that moment. And I Googled Bitcoin. He had said crypto, but in my mind, I immediately thought of Bitcoin. And I pulled it up and I saw that Bitcoin was 17000 from a buck, from a dollar. It was $17,000. And it was the biggest slap in the face for me. I thought that I had missed the bus. And I was like, oh, man, I probably should have looked into that sooner. But I just kept holding on to that. What is money? And I start researching, comparing Bitcoin to the dollar and trying to like just get my mind wrapped around exactly what this thing is. So I went from there and I did still buy it at that moment. I was still pretty much just trying to figure it out. But I knew enough to see, okay, Bitcoin, there's only 21 million of those. And with fiat, the dollar is unlimited. Then I start learning about other countries and what happened in Venezuela, what happened in Weimar, Germany, what happened in Zimbabwe, what their currencies and how it just devastated a lot of people when their currencies are collapsing and having to change currencies multiple times. I thought how awful that was and how that can possibly happen to us here in America. And I was like, yeah, I've really got to look more into this thing. And then... After 2017, the very next year in 2018, which was only a couple of months from it, I saw that Bitcoin had crashed to $4,000 from $17,000. And I was like, see, I'm glad I didn't put my money in there. I was already going right back. So oh, I'm so glad I didn't put my money in there. I know that it was, there's something to it, but I'm just, I'm glad I didn't buy it at 17000 and then have to write it down at 4000 But So I'm still trying to battle with you know, this Bitcoin thing and how volatile it was. The next year or within the next few months or however, it was $13,000. And I'm still doing my research at this time. And I was also part of the FIRE movement at that time. And so we had already had an idea a little bit about inflation, that we had to keep up with inflation and investments and all. But at that moment, it was so much happening all at once. Once I saw that it had hit 13000 though, I was like, okay, maybe there's something to it. This thing is not dying. So let me take another look at the Bitcoin thing. And I was like, okay, if it can reclaim its rightful place at $17,000, i will know it's for sure. It's legit. So I, I got a notification on my phone a few months later that it had hit 16000 And I was like, okay, this is my chance. I'm going to do this thing this time. I'm going to go for it. So... My husband and I talked about it. We start moving the accounts around and we made our very first purchase of Bitcoin in the um, winter of 2020. I think it was around December or so. That was it. We were hooked then. We were in. We just kept learning and figuring out about self-custody. And then I found the Bitcoin community and I start really enjoying that part. I enjoy the things that they were saying. It resonated with me. Their values aligned with mine. And there's all these pocket communities of Bitcoin too, where you have one group that's don't eat seed oils. And then you have another one. You have to put your feet on solid ground, like take your shoes off and connect with the earth and get your body fit. It's just so exciting seeing all of these different people from all around the world, all these different backgrounds that have such a passion for Bitcoin and the economies. And I start learning about El Salvador and about different countries that are all coming together, trying to get themselves out of a tough spot when it comes to inflation, coming to um, the realization that Bitcoin is going to solve a lot of these problems that we have, because there's been a lot of bad practices with money, both here in America and other countries, from really the beginning of the centuries, because the more I start looking into Bitcoin is, I had so many questions, and I'm coming from a Christian background anyway, and so this helped me to really do more of a deep dive and learning about how the world works and how the money system even got started. And then I started learning about the fall of Rome, which everybody's talking about on TikTok now, but it's really also in the Bible. Like it talks a lot about what happened with Caesar and how he was chipping off the gold coins and causing inflation with everybody and the borders were wide open towards the end of an empire falling not just rome it goes all the way back to the sodom and gomorrah things that happened in egypt all the famines and how food was scarce and people was panicking and how the emperors and the kings at the time they took those opportunities to enslave people and to cause 
all these different heartaches and all these different problems. And it's just copy and paste. It's just been happening for centuries and centuries. And just having that realization, it's just, it was crazy. And then I'm not sure exactly at what point, but at some point I came across something that Satoshi Nakamoto wrote on the Bitcoin blockchain when he was talking about the things that was happening over in Europe on the brink of the, I think it was the third bailout at that time or second or third bailout. And he put a note in there in that section about Romans 12, 21, about, you know, not being overcome with evil, but with overcoming it with good. And that just, it, I have goosebumps in that moment when I saw that. It was just so awesome. I was like, wow, maybe Satoshi Nakamoto was inspired by the Holy Spirit in order to create Bitcoin for us, in order to be a safe boat to get out of a corrupt monetary system. And I've just been going down this rabbit hole even further, learning more about the economy, learning more about monetary policy, learning about how our federal system manipulate interest rates and the boom and bust economy and about the differences between the Keynesian economics versus the Australian. And so it's just been a lot. It's, it's exciting. And I don't really understand how Bitcoin works on a technical scale, but I know, an, I don't know how my cell phone works on a technical scale. I don't know how the internet works on a technical scale, but I don't really care. Like as long as it works and as long as I know that, okay, there's 21 million coins. It's released slowly over time. And the last one is not going to be mined until the year 2140. So this is going to be something that's a gift to all of us, not just us in this current generation, but for all the generations behind us. It's something that's going to really help us out a lot when it comes to protecting our purchasing power and protecting our freedom. And yeah. I can feel your passion coming through the microphone. It's actually very <laughs> contagious. It's wonderful. Okay, I just, I want to circle back. You covered a lot. So I want to circle back to that moment when you started asking yourself questions about the monetary or just what is money? I don't think that's a very common thing because most people don't stop to ask themselves that question. So if you go back, it was 2017 when you started asking that question. Yes. What in your personal experiences prompted you to chase that question? Figuring out what investments and all, we knew that we had to keep up with inflation. A lot of the fire movement people were saying that, okay, once you reach the million dollar point, then you can live off of 4% and then you'll be able to earn 40,000 a year and then you'll be straight. But after some time, and especially after what happened in 2019 with, and 2020 with everything that happened with the pandemic, so much money was printed during that time. And I was like, there's no way we're going to be able to just withdraw 4% if inflation is 10, 15, 20% for food. Some food items would double. And so we're dealing with hundreds of percent of inflation. And I was like, I'm not sure about this. I might have to go back to the drawing board. And I was also reading books, The Millionaire Next Door. I was reading Robert Kiyosaki's book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. So I had a little bit of information about it already, about money, but I just never asked more questions about the essence of money, the history, the deep history of how money is and how money has changed from different things over time. How at one point it was um, seashells and how another point it was they used salt as currency. And they've used different things over time. So it doesn't have to be a paper fiat. It was gold at one point. We know what happened back in, I think it was what, in like 1971 when gold was removed from the dollar. And so it's just over time, it's changed, but it's, it's up to what the community says money is, whatever we see as what value is, and we exchange value for value. Can you explain what the FIRE movement is? You mentioned it a couple of times. I'm not familiar with that. Yeah, it's mostly known as Choose FI, F-I, and it's pretty much financial independence, retire early. And it's a just a group of people from all over the world who decided to live on either half of their income or less than half of their income. And you just pretty much pool that money into either stocks or equities or whatever it is that you feel most compelled that it's the best asset. And at that time, we were doing the total stock market, which was the BTSAX. And so it's pretty much the, um, well, there was two, really, because we split ours. Most of the community was using BTSAX, which is the total stock market. But we were also using um, the S&P 500 as well. So we had it split between the two. 
And the S&P 500 is just the 500 best stocks, the best performing stocks. So you have your Apple, your Microsoft, Tesla is a part of that now. And so it's just the big hitters and the total stock market is just pretty much everything. So instead of you having to pick one particular stock and knowing how to do research and on exactly what's a good company and all of their earning stuff, you pretty much just cast your net wide and just buy all of them. But eventually I no longer aligned with just buying all of them because when you're buying all of them, you're also buying tobacco companies, you're buying different pharmaceutical companies that you may not feel so strongly about anymore. And so we no longer want it to be a part of the total stock market. So we pretty much streamlined back and then we went more so just Tesla. And then when we figured out Bitcoin, we started to move it more splitting between Tesla and Bitcoin to have a part of both systems because we're not sure exactly how long it's going to take for Bitcoin to get where we want it to be in our lifetime. It looks it's going to be much sooner than later at this point. But just going by comfort level, we wanted to make sure we had a, a good balance in the portfolio so that we felt protected in one way or the other. So it sounds like it took you about two to three years of a lot of research, keeping an eye on how the Bitcoin market is moving before you jumped in with both feet. Now, when you and your husband were discussing going into the Bitcoin space with such commitment, what was his reaction? Actually, he was saying stuff about Bitcoin before I did, but it just took me longer. I'm just so apprehensive and I guess I'm a little stubborn too. I had already gotten comfortable with the idea of, okay, we have our investment set. We can even retire early now. We can move to Florida. Everything is set. I didn't want anything disrupting that. And so it it took a little while longer for me, but it, it but eventually I, I, I decided, okay, yeah, I think you're, I think you might've been onto something with this. And then I just ran with it. It got to the point that I was researching stuff for hours of the day. I was watching the Simply Bitcoin podcast. I was watching Swan Bitcoin. I'm looking at all these ways that you can earn free Bitcoin with the Bitcoin magazine. Have They have the articles you can read and you can earn Bitcoin from that. The Thunder Games, then the Fold Card came out. So I was like, I can put all our expenses on Fold Card and then we can earn Bitcoin. So it was just all these things. And I was spending a lot of time. I think maybe it was a couple of times I didn't even eat because I was just so excited about this field. I was so excited about everything that was happening. Wow, how did I miss this for so long? Because again, I knew about it since 2011, but it was just, I had all of this. I had over a whole, what, 13 years, 12, 13 years of information just all at once that I was trying to consume. So now that you're fully in it, you are also now trying to spread Bitcoin to other people, sharing it with pre-coiners, sharing it with your church. Tell us a little bit more about what you're doing. Yes. So I have a couple of Bitcoin t-shirts that I wear and whether I'm just going to the grocery store or if I'm on vacation in Alaska, I'm wearing my Bitcoin tees and I'm going to different merchants. If I'm going to a coffee shop, I'll ask them if they accept Bitcoin. I know they don't accept Bitcoin, but I'm going to ask them anyway, just so I can make it normal for them to have people ask them about Bitcoin and for them to see the Bitcoin logo. And I'll repost a meme on Twitter or I'll post Bitcoin content, Bitcoin education, either on my social media, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, any way I can spread it. My church also have their own app called School App which is Twitter and it's just for our church. And so I'll post anything there that's relevant also to the Bible to just to keep it connected. I just try to spread it and talk about it with my family and friends and anyone who will listen really. So let's talk about the church specifically. There's the group, Thank God for Bitcoin, that are both Christian and Bitcoin and trying to spread the good news about the good news about Bitcoin. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when it comes to missionary work, there's a lot of obstacles financially that they would have to overcome to support their missionaries overseas. What is it like for you trying to share Bitcoin with your church and the general Christian community? I've been sharing, that was one of the books I've been reading. 
I've been reading, thank God for Bitcoin. And I've shared that with my church, let them know that things like Bitcoin Christians exist and that <laughs> there's something that they might want to look at because a lot of people are talking about inflation. That's one of the biggest prayers that we have in our community is people asking for prayers over financial problems and hardships that they're having. People are being evicted. People are struggling to pay their bills and electricity costs. They're talking about how their electric bill is two, three hundred dollars and they don't know what they're going to do. And so I want them to know what the reason is behind that. Is something wrong with the money? And actually, people will say the money is broken, but the money really isn't broken. This is systematically designed to be this way to make the rich richer and the poor poor. So I just want to make them aware, hey, this is what's happening with our money, Terry Supply, and this is what happened to other countries before us. And it's, what's going to happen is all of the other currencies are going to pretty much fall into the dollar because the dollar is the strongest of all of the currencies at this moment. But eventually it's going gonna, it's gonna to get to the point that the dollar is also just as worthless as probably the currency in Weimar Germany. Like Historically, this has happened over and over again for centuries countries, bad monetary policies have caused their currencies to collapse. And I want to make my church aware that this can happen to us here in America as well. And I want them to be aware of what's happening and what the solution is. And that solution would be Bitcoin. So when you talk to them about that, what is their reaction? What is their number one objection or question that you hear? They are mostly concerned about the volatility of Bitcoin. They don't really understand the ins and outs, but the number one thing that I hear them say is the volatility. But then I have to remind them that both currencies are volatile. Bitcoin is volatile and the dollar is volatile. But Bitcoin is volatile to the upside over time and the dollar is volatile to the downside. So I pretty much am like, you have to pick your volatile. I've never heard it put that way, that the dollar is volatile. Has anybody asked you to explain that further? No, they just stare <laughs> or they'd be like, okay, or like, they might part it or something because that's pretty much the end of it there. But I'll still go on further to tell them more about Bitcoin and also to give them resources that they can look more into what it is and also show them Christian based stuff that's related to Bitcoin, the thank God for Bitcoin and different YouTube channels that they can see and talking about just Whatever I felt that person that kind of resonate with their personality and what can help them out. And have you been able to convince them that it is worth the risk of the volatility? I think so. So far, they, no one said, no, I'm not interested yet. So <laughs> I feel like just like when I'm evangelizing about the gospel of Christ, you're either watering a seed or you are planting a seed, or you're actually saving a soul. You're either planting, watering, or saving a soul. So it's the same when it comes to Bitcoin, is if you're planting a seed there, and it's up to them what they're going to do with it, or if they've heard of Bitcoin before, and they're just on a fence and they're not sure, then just giving them some new information of resources that they can use, maybe it's watering that seed of their curiosity about Bitcoin, and maybe they'll take it a little bit further besides just asking a few questions and they'll actually put some action behind it. And maybe for some people, that little information that we give them is enough for them to be like, you know what, that makes a lot of sense. And I think I'm going to go ahead and just buy like $20 of Bitcoin and see how it works from there while I'm doing some research. But I try not to be pushy about it. It's up to them. Everybody has to have their own experience. They have to go down their own rabbit hole. And it took me over a decade in order for it to actually click for me. So I'm in no position to judge there. So just however people come to it, it's their individual journey. Yeah, that is so true. I'm just really curious because you are so proactive and so intentional about managing your money. And that's such a tough place to be for most of us to be that disciplined. Can you walk us through your mentality when you even came across the FIRE movement in the first place and why you decided to put yourself in that? It sounds pretty rigorous what you guys were planning to do and very intentional. What was your mentality when you entered into that program? Yes, they talked a lot about inflation and about how a lot of people, they wait 
or they work all their life and then they end up having to retire at maybe 60 or 70 years old. Or in some people, they never get a chance to retire because they're just so focused on buying material things and they're not really focused on making sure that their financial health is good. And I was like, man, I don't want to have to wait until I'm 70 to retire. I was comfortable with living on half my income in order to pull more money into us investing so that we can retire a little bit earlier, much earlier than that. And so that's what did it for us. Just understanding that all of the things that we had, all of the stuff that's on our kitchen counter that used to be money, all of the clothes in my closet, all of the shoes, all of the purses, all of the trinkets, all of the gadgets, that was all money that was spent. We made a decision at that moment to either buy a thing or buy back our life, buy back our time. And that was important to me. So we decided this was our best option is to go down our budget, seeing what we can cut out of our budget in order to invest our money. And then we both had things that we were not going to cut. We were still going to travel because that was important to us. So the travel budget was going to stay. And things like clothes, that wasn't as important to either one of us. So we cut back on our clothing budget. We cut back like on buying new shoes and things. Plus, as we were um, seeing that, okay, these are hours of our life. It's not things anymore. It's literally hours of our life. And so once that clicked for us, we started to shift some stuff. And I wanted to keep chocolates because I love chocolate. <laughs> I love chocolate. I like coffee. So I would keep those. And then we would cut our, our food budget. We cut other things. And we pretty much, when we get a steak, we would cut it up so that we would still have steak. But it would just be a smaller amount. We had more rice and vegetables or whatever. And so we just made those different types of things. We didn't buy a lot of gifts and stuff anymore. Our gift for each other was our time together and knowing that we were going to be able to retire one day and move to Florida and be close to the theme parks and close to being able to travel and take cruises. That was our goal. And so we decided to live on half of our income and we did that for almost five years. That is so impressive. I am so impressed by your commitment. That's just absolutely incredible and mind-blowing, actually. So are you able to convince your children to do the same? Are they on board? I hope so. They consider it our Bitcoin, their Bitcoin. So they know that they're going to inherit it anyway. So it's difficult to get them to understand. But so we're working on them because we want them to be good stewards with our Bitcoin. It, all of it belongs to God anyway. We're all just here stewarding his wealth. But I also want them to know this is how you make a transaction and this is how you keep your seed phrase safe and the importance of not putting your Bitcoin on platforms where they promise you interest and then they end up repulling you. So I want them to understand that part of it. So we're, it's a working progress. They're teenagers. And so they're more interested in doing things with their friends and they're looking for cars at this point now. So it's a process with them. I have teenagers and early 20s, 20 years. What do we call them? Early 20 years. But yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they still see the world differently. Anyway, we have the benefit of decades of experience. So <laughs> we're looking back. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's talk about all the stuff that you have experienced after fully entering the Bitcoin space. You mentioned that there are different pockets of Bitcoiners you have really connected with. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yes, there was a video that I believe Natalie did about seed oils and about fiat foods. So this is a pocket of Bitcoiners when it comes to like being more health conscious and things like that and having a fit mind and a fit body. And it changed the way that I looked at stuff. I didn't know that the oils that I was putting in my body was causing us to become sick. And so I start looking at the seed oils. Hey, what is a seed oil? And I start looking at, okay, that means canola oil, vegetable oil, all those oils are trash for your system and that you should have more healthy fats, beef tallow and avocado oil and just using real grass-fed butter, grass-fed beef. There was another one on the beef initiative that we learned about steaks and making sure you know where your steaks are coming from, where they're sourced from, and making sure that they're grass-fed and grass-finished because that was a thing too. A lot of companies will say that it's grass-fed beef and then you found out the last six months of the, the cow's life, they did grain-fed and you don't know what's all inside that grain. So just trying to be more aware of what are we putting in our body and 
I, I know a lot of Bitcoiners are also keto. Keto helped me a lot with getting into my wedding dress for a while because I was, I think I was a size nine and the wedding dress that I bought was a size six because it was the only one that they had in stock and it was the one that I wanted so much. So I did keto for almost like two months in order to fit in my wedding dress and now I'm happily married. <laughs> And I was able to fit in my dress. So keto definitely works. It should be more of a lifestyle. But if you're just trying to do a reset of your system, that was really beneficial to us. And just cutting out a lot of the junk food that we was eating, or at least trying to eat it more sparingly and being aware of what we're doing. So we're making a conscious decision at that moment, whether what we're doing. My struggle with knowing fiat food versus healthy food and trying to put money into Bitcoin is that the fiat food is cheap for a reason. It's been subsidized. It's been super processed. It's very yeah. convenient. It's less expensive versus do we invest in buying grass-fed beef or do we just buy some crackers and those squeezable cheese things? You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You can buy beef jerky. <laughs> yeah. You can snack on beef jerky, which is quite expensive, or you can snack on crackers. And then there's this kind of pull in either direction, especially when you're raising kids and you become aware of these things, eating mm -hmm. healthy is expensive. It is. Our grocery bill has doubled over the last few years. And we're buying basically the same stuff. It's just the price of it has doubled. And, and I just wonder, man, how are people really making it? And then TikTok responds to that because there's so many videos with people are talking about how hard it is just to be able to keep up with just the staple stuff. You go to the grocery store and you buy a couple of basic goods and it's 90 bucks. And it's something that would have cost $20, $25 just a few years ago. And then you hear about people in Canada and the stuff that happened with them. It's really rough. And and we have the reserve currency. That's what makes it so bad is we are here in America. We have all this financial privilege and we're struggling here as a collective. And, and then we think outside the box, outside of that privilege to people that are in countries that have developing currencies or developing economies. And I just, I feel so bad for them. And I pray often for the world because it's just in such a broken state and people are all searching for something to fill that void. And they're filling it with a lot of things that are just no good for them. And a lot of that is because they don't know their identity in Christ. We're like heirs to the kingdom anyway. And a lot of people don't understand that. They feel they're removed from God or they feel they're just stuck in whatever rut that they're in the moment. And they feel so alone and so feelings of rejection and feelings of just despair because it's it's everywhere you look, people are saying the same thing. And it's really bad. and It's hard to see it. It's really interesting to think that, especially in the health arena, everybody's looking for solutions. And we are questioning what's happening today because, at least for some people, access to medical care without insurance is near impossible unless you want to go into debt forever and ever. And so alternative health practices that we have been discouraged to pursue before, an example would be using herbs or adaptogens. Not very long ago, we were highly discouraged from doing that. Meditation was highly discouraged. Oh, no, you can't empty your mind because the devil will go in there. And you know that verse in the Bible where it says, <laughs> if you clean the house and you don't fill it with something, you're basically just cleaning it for a bad spirit to come in. A lot of people are looking for answers and they're all just doing their very best to consider different alternatives. Yeah, that's what it is. It's, it's everybody is just so busy with trying to get their basic needs met that they can't think beyond that moment. They're trying to pay rent. They're trying to make sure they have food on the table for their kids. And so a lot of times they're not interested in other things, trying to figure out, okay, what's really going on at the root cause? What is causing this? And to be honest, there's th this happened so many times, like copy and paste, like I said, for centuries and centuries. This has been happening from biblical days about what's been going on with bad monetary policies. But at the root of all of this is really back to it's, the basic of it is good and evil. There's huge forces that is causing a lot of this stuff that we're experiencing. And this is the time that the devil has his reign. He has already lost the war. We know that God wins in the end. He's already won. He won on the cross. But the devil is, he's so busy because he knows that he's lost. So see, he's just trying to get as many souls as he can in order to distract people with these different things in order to just keep them in despair and keep them like 
just exhausted with life that they don't even really have the energy to even look at things on a broader level. Yeah, that's one of the things that I uh, actually discussed with a vet tech that I told you about who came into our waiting room and started asking me about crypto and how it's different from Bitcoin and things like that. And we were chatting about the mentality of trading crypto to try to capture profit and the fact that all of us nowadays tend to feel like we have two jobs. We have one job to earn money and then another mm-hmm. job to try to keep it somehow. And you're already exactly <laughs> and you're already exhausted from the first job because you're working your butt off for that. And then when you then have to think about how to keep your money, you start to look for shortcuts because how many hours in a day do we have? How many hours in a day can we focus our mental energy? And when you take shortcuts, that's when you get burned uh, sometimes. Exactly. That's what you're saying. We're just we're so distracted by surviving that I, I feel Bitcoin is actually a simplifier because you don't have to you do have to research and you do have to do your homework and get educated on that. But once you decide that's the right thing, you can use it without having to work more for it. You can preserve your wealth with it. So if you convert your dollars into Bitcoin, you don't then have to keep working to maintain its purchasing power. You can just go, okay, I'm done now. Exactly. Because it's basically just math. We're still learning about Bitcoin because it's, it's so many more levels that's beyond our understanding of it. But the base level of just the fact that there's only 21 million and how every four years, the amount of mine supply is cut in half. That was even something that was new to me. When I first like started to figure out Bitcoin, it took me an- another year or so before I learned about the halvenings and how Bitcoiners celebrate the halvenings every four years with big parties and celebrations. I know the next one is going to be in El Salvador. And like just learning about all the different communities and economies that are growing um, on top of that. It's just, it's so exciting the the energy that's behind this project and Just knowing that there's going to be more levels built on top of it. There's the base level and then there's the lightning network and then there's probably going to be a third one. And it's just going to grow beyond our capacity to be able to even understand how big this thing can be. But the fact that the the way how it's set up is designed for you to just become wealthier and wealthier over time. And Bitcoin, I said, it's on a world stage right now. So everybody is watching and trying to see what's this, what's about to happen with it. We have so much institutional adoption that's about to pretty much catapult this thing, especially right around the time it's having an event. You have companies now able to hold Bitcoin on their balance sheet and not be penalized by this whatever law it was that they anytime Bitcoin goes down, they were dinged for it. But when Bitcoin goes up, they didn't get any benefit or reward. And now whatever the law that is, is about to change. And so now companies are able to hold Bitcoin on their balance sheet. And so I really want the plebs, the little people to get Bitcoin as much as they can before this happens. So that's why another reason I'm so passionate about it, because I want the us, I want just the regular people to be able to get on this lifeboat before BlackRock has all of it or different companies and institutions are able to just grab it all. And then it'll be difficult for the average person to hold a whole Bitcoin. It's already hard enough now. If you can just have a tenth of a Bitcoin, you're probably going to be pretty much set. But of course, the goal is to have that one whole, that one whole coin, which is important to so many people. But those Satoshis are going to be very valuable. So just try to get as many as you can. I feel the same urgency because once they step in, they are moving so much money at one time. Yes, trillions of dollars. And we're little guys. We're everyday guys. We are feeling the pain when the gas goes up by five cents. (laughs) So yes, I feel the same urgency and I definitely can feel your passion. So what are you doing right now actively on a daily basis to share Bitcoin other than with your church and also with the merchants? I post Bitcoin content as much as possible. I retweet things. I started, I have a little baby YouTube channel. I'm trying to get both the gospel out there of Christ. And I'm trying to also explain to people about Bitcoin. So I'm showing different things that they can, anything that's coming up in the media or any type of news flash, especially what just happened with us hitting the $33 trillion mark in our U.S. debt clock. So that's something that I've been sharing to let everybody know, hey, we were just at $32 trillion a couple of months ago. We just spent a trillion dollars in three months. 
is this registering to anyone how fast this is going? They have to keep printing at this point. The interest that we're paying on our debt is equal to our military spending. It's something that's just going to keep going. And I want people to know, hey, this is happening really fast. It happens gradually and then suddenly. It can literally be overnight and we're in hyperinflation. We, we just never know when that moment is going to come. So it's best to have Bitcoin and to start understanding it before that moment comes. So what is the name of your YouTube channel? I have it as Praven underscore Yeshua underscore BTC. Because I'm on a mission to spread Bitcoin to Bitcoin Christians the most because I want God's people to have Bitcoin the most. So I'm spreading that and um, showing them ways that they can get um, free Bitcoin and also like just sending them a few sats. Before, we used to have something called faucets. Now, this was before me, but I know that there was different accounts that you can go to and you can receive five Bitcoin a day just by entering a CAPTCHA. You just hit a button and then they'll send you free Bitcoin. So I don't have five Bitcoins to be sending out to anyone, but I can, I send people Satoshis to their account just to get them to download wallets, the moon wallet or different lightning wallets. And anyone that I, I see that may be interested in, like I'll talk to them about it and try to show them how that works. And yeah, just trying to spread it. I also started to save some Bitcoin for different ministries and stuff just to be able to support them because I know that there's going to come a day where they're going to come for the church. And so I want to make sure that the ministries that I support and the charities that I support, they're going to still be okay. And yeah, I, I've just started to try to share information to Bitcoin Christians and to everyone really, because everybody is a potential. I, I want to save as many souls as I can. And I want to get as many people on the Bitcoin lifeboat as possible. I care more about your soul than Bitcoin at this moment. So I want to just try to share to talk to people about it. Like I said, I wear the t-shirts, I repost the memes, I post Bitcoin content information and talk to them a little bit about how this has happened just for centuries. This is not new. Like, yeah, we're experiencing all this stuff now, but we're not the first one to experience this. We're not the first people to go through all these different famines and stuff that's happening. We're not the first people to go through different ways to enslave people, all the different taxes and stuff. They used to have to pay interest on money when they used to borrow it, even back in the early, early before Christ days. So none of this is new. It's just our time. And, and it's also Bitcoin's time because nothing can stop an idea whose time has come. And we're here. Cool. So what would you say to someone who is still sitting on the fence about Bitcoin? I would tell them to just take the moment, make a date with yourself, grab a coffee, grab a snack or whatever it is, and just sit down and compare Bitcoin side by side with the U.S. dollar or whatever your native currency is. Just take a look at them both. Look at it from the beginning, from the inception point, really, if you can. Just go all the way back. And also read some parts of the Bible just to understand what's happened even there, because that's the beginning of time. So just take it, put it side by side and compare it and do your own research. Just take a look. This is something that's going to be not only for you, but for your kids and your kids and they're all the generations after. We all just have to do our part to make sure that we're going to be protected and our purchasing power is going to be protected. And the freedom part of it, because people think about Bitcoin and they think about number go up. They think about it, the investment part here in America and then outside of America, they're thinking about, OK, this is going to allow me to be able to buy bread for the day. Okay, so we have the medium of exchange there, and then we also have the investment side. That's just two parts, but Bitcoin has so many more parts to that. Take what happened in Canada with the truckers. They did not want to take the thing, and they pretty much shut down their bank accounts. They shut down their bank accounts. They punished people who were trying to support them, Bitcoiners who sent money to make sure that they can eat and stuff. And the people who were just at local shops, they would try to give them coffee and food 
and they would come for those businesses. They were shutting down those people's businesses that supported the truckers and stuff. The fact that they was trying to cancel their mortgages and cancel their bank accounts, that's, that's a red flag that this can happen. And we have these CBDCs that are going to be coming out soon. They're already been started in other countries and they are making all of the implementation for it here. And so we just have to know that the moment is going to come one day that, you know, the, the mark of the beast too, but it starts off as being this cute little app and they'll give you $500 to download it. But then eventually there is, you're not going to be able to buy or sell a trade without being able to have this thing, whatever the, it's going to come. It can be in the hand or forehead on the app or whatever it is. It's going to come a day that your morals are going to be on the line. What are you going to do? Are you going to take something that you don't feel is good for you in order to save your job and to save your career and to, for whatever the case is, you're, you're going to have that moment that you have to make a decision and it'll be good to be able to know that, okay, I have Bitcoin. And so it doesn't matter if they try to shut down my bank accounts. I have that, that, that amount of Bitcoin and I can just trade value for value with someone at my local farmer's market. So that's another good idea too, is to go to local farmer markets because to know at least what days they meet up so that you can go and support local. And you can also wear your Bitcoin t-shirts and talk to them about Bitcoin. You have a beef guy, you have a vegetable guy, and you have a lady that has milk or have eggs and stuff because you just never know when that moment might come. And it's a good idea to, to have that. So you just have to protect yourself and to know that we're not alone in here. God didn't leave us orphaned. He loves us and he sent his son to die for us, for all of our sins and for to know that we're all one body. We're all connected. We're all people having individual lives, but we're also connected on a spiritual level too. And we want the best for each other. We want to see each other doing well and able to support their family and, and not have to worry about tyranny. I feel so inspired. I feel like you, you can stand on the stage and give that talk and just mesmerize the whole audience. <laughs> Thank you so much for spending time with us. I have really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you for sharing your story and your experiences. That was awesome. Thank you so much for having me, Tally. This has been awesome for real. Thank you for listening to this episode. Did you enjoy it? Wasn't our guest absolutely fabulous? I just love every woman's story on this show. Everybody has a unique perspective, and yet we all come to the same place, which is Bitcoin is an important part of our lives. If this story has inspired you and you would like to know more, go to www.orangechatter.com. Get involved, join our reading group, send me an email, and introduce yourself. I will be so happy to hear from you. The best way you can support this show is to spread the word. Tell every woman you know to listen in. You never know how they will be impacted by these stories. I appreciate you so much. See you next time. Bye. This episode is sponsored by Free Market Kids.